Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And as you can see, I've got some posts. And this is kind of the post I like the most because it's just sent uh, by viewers and patrons of the channel who, who are looking at specific content and are like, hmm, you know what? I want to help you out. They're just sending stuff to me, which is really, really cool. Um, this, I think, is uh, something sent to me by Robert. I could be wrong, of course, because there's no... Uh, name here at the back. So all I can go on is the Tim Dean Chandra. I do see this code kind of this is something we use in the Netherlands to send our mail. So I do think this is from the Netherlands. And if it's from uh, Robert, I think he's probably sent me a couple of cards to use in my revised unsleeved deck because he sent me a message. He said, oh man, you can really use a clone in one of your decks. And I've got the perfect beat up revised copy for you. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that's it. But you never know, it could be something completely different. So let's just uh, open it up and we'll see. Maybe it's something I ordered, that could be the case as well. And I, I simply forgot, well, not forgot, but it arrives sooner than I expected. Ah, yes, here we go. Hi, Tim, here are some options and some problems. Enjoy the games, Robert. Ah, oh, thank you, Robert, really appreciate this. Oh, look at this, look at it. Beautiful beat up lightning bolt, and I can definitely use a lightning bolt. Although we don't want to have too many lightning bolts, right? We want to kind of keep the fun, so. But one lightning bolt, I think it's okay. I mean, if you looked at the videos, my opponent, my brother was playing, um, was playing a nightmare, so that was pretty strong. So we've got a lightning bolt. Interesting, in his uh, letter here, he says, Enjoy the games. There are some options, but also some problems. I think he's referring to uh, a black card that's meant to go to my brother. So let's have a look first. So we've got a nice beat up lightning bolt. So that's, that's kind of in the right. Oh yeah, yeah. It's kind of hard to see it on camera. Maybe, although maybe you see it better than, than I do at my angle at the moment, but Oh, look at this corner. Yeah, this is really chewed up dog ear corner. So this is perfect for unsleeved revised. If you haven't seen the unsleeved, revi unsleeved revised videos, by the way, I'll put the link uh, in the description below. Actually, I'll just have an info card popping up right now and you can just visit the match if you want to. Um, ooh, this is a super beat up clone. That's perfect. Clone is one of my favorite cards and one of the first cards that I remember really pulling out of a revised booster pack. The reason is because of these two stars. I was completely like baffled. I was like, what, what are these stars? Wait a minute, this creature can be anything on the board? Only for four mana I can copy everything on the board? So I was really, really impressed with the power of this creature. And I must say when I started playing with it, it didn't disappoint. Um, you know, one of the downsides obviously is when you play this and your opponent finds some way to get rid of the target that you want to copy and you have to choose a lesser target or even worse, there's no target on the board. Um, but when that didn't happen, the clone is really strong. Oh, look at, look at how beat up this is. I think this saw some playgrounds in its day. Let me know it over if you also played this one sleeveless or where you got it from. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. I'm really going to enjoy playing this. Look at this one. Just gonna put these away. Look at this one. Chewed up. Dog ear. Ooh, we got some other cards here that I don't want to show yet. Let us chewed up ear. Absolutely perfect for unsleeved revised. Ah, oh, so nice. Thank you, Robert, for sharing this with me. Really, really appreciate it. Ah, oh, definitely going in. Um, okay, so we've got some more cards here. Just gonna order them a little bit. We've got the Giant Spider. Actually a pretty good card. I think Giant Spider doesn't see as much play because of the Urnum Jin in old school. So if you've got to choose between an Urnum and a Giant Spider, you would usually go for the Urnum. Although, you know, because of City in a Bottle, Urnum has gotten a little weaker in old school, I guess, but it's still an amazingly strong creature. Um, but Giant Spider, you know, it's actually pretty good. You know, you've got a 2-4 that can block flyers, uh, only for one green and three, so it's, it's easy to splash if you want to. If you put a Giant Growth on this, it can kill a Sarah Angel. If you've got two of these Giant Spiders, um, you know, it can also kill a, a 
a Sarah Angel in a block, and it's not going to be very uh, very good block for uh, for the attacker. And uh, like I said, with the with the giant growth, it can actually not just kill Sarah Angel. It can also kill a Shivan Dragon. It can kill well, not a Mahamoti Jin, unfortunately, but it can kill quite a lot. So. This card is really good, and if you've got a um, Wailuli Wolf next to it, you can actually give it five defense, and it can block so many flyers in old school. So really, really good. So Giant Spider, definitely going to use that one. Rod of Ruin, yeah, this is cool. Oh, I have to say this Rod of Ruin is looking a little bit almost too good to be played, I guess. We got we got some some damage here. I have to I have to inspect it further. And the second rod of ruin, really really cool. And I think I already saw the card after this. This is where the problems begin for me because he also sent some hypnotic specters, not for me, but for my brother to play. Um, maybe Robert, these are going to get lost in the mail. Oh, look at those corners. This kind of. It's kind of nice, but this is of course where we have to kind of look at as we're playing this uh, revised starter deck unsleeved format is like how many um, cards, how optimal do you want to make the decks? And we're definitely, I, I definitely think there's space for one Hypnotic Spectre, maybe two Hypnotic Spectres, but Hypnotic Spectre is so strong and so, um, it can be so devastating in a game so we'll have to look into it. But I mean, I do love it that you've sent me these. Oh, look at the back. <laughs> oh, this is this is perfect for unsleeved revised though. I cannot I cannot ignore these beautiful beat up corners here. These dog ears, these ones here. That is really what old school was about. You would see this all the time, these dog ears on cards. It would just happen because of the shuffling mainly because of the shuffling and kind of this back that you see here on the clone is really what would happen by playing it just on the surface without without one of these mats, right? That I've got here just playing on a on the surface outside or a dirty table or whatever. Yeah. Very cool, very cool. And also here, nice. Nice beat up edges there and some surface damage. That is nice. That, these are cards I can definitely use for Unsleep Revised. Thank you, Robert. Very much appreciate it, man. Really, really nice that you're sending this over. Really, really cool. Oh, man. Definitely gonna, gonna play these. Getting the camera back in focus. Really, really cool. And of course, here the giant spider and uh, the Rod of Runes are also perfect for one of my decks. It's kind of build around uh, walls and fogs, and then they just want to ping from behind the walls and the fog magic. So that's actually perfect. So, oh yeah, here we go. And then there's this pack. This is a big pack. Boom, boom. It's from the United States. It's from Plague Doctor. He is one of the patrons of the channel. And uh, he's got beautiful, uh, a beautiful alpha deck that's also featured on the channel, by the way. So I'll put a link to that specific match. It's really, really nice. And I've actually got a uh, play doctor. You don't know this, but I still have a match that we played on my hard drive that I'll probably upload on the channel as well. I just need, you know, I need more time. I've got so many cool matches still, uh, but I just need time to uh, to edit it all and to, to put it on the YouTube channel. So here we go. We're gonna open it up. Nice bubble envelope all the way from the United States. For the people that don't know, I'm located here in Amsterdam. We've got a smaller envelope. This is chock full, it seems, of cards. It is a little bit crazy. So we're gonna open this. I have just no idea what's in here. Start here, old mage, if you dare. Start here, old mage, if you dare, okay. Wow. I wonder what all of this is, if you dare. Okay. This is, okay, okay, is this also a letter I, I've got to read first? 
I think so. I'm gonna I'm gonna turn it around. Tim, enjoy this trip down memory lane throughout the early days of magic. Keep on pinging, Plague Doctor. Wow, cool. Okay, enjoy the memory lane trip down memory lane. I definitely will. Okay, okay, okay. So here we go. Oh, sweet. Phantasmal terrain. Wow, is this alpha? Let me have a look. Probably need to start on the other side, I'm now realizing, but let me first enjoy this absolute beauty. Wow, Phantasmal Terrain. Two blue, Enchant Land. The, the funny thing about this card, I used to play this actually back in the day, uh, in my revised days when I started, and I used to think that Phantasmal Terrain, you had to turn a land into an island, and it took me a while to realize, wait a minute, target land changes to any basic land type of the caster's choice. So it doesn't have to be an island. Obviously, my strategy was play with island walkers and give my opponent an island. And then I had unblockable creatures. But as you know, a lot of people started playing with blue more and more and more. Um, that wasn't actually the case when I started playing at first, by the way. Not, not a lot of people played with blue, but it became more and more popular. And then so my Phantasmal Terrain, in my eyes, was not as good anymore. And then I started rereading it and I realized, wait a minute, I don't have to change it into a basic island. I can choose any land. So really nice. Um, okay, you know what? I'm just gonna, this is the pile and I'm just gonna start. It's just, you've sent so many cards. Wow, I just, I don't know what to say really. Um, let's just have a look. Ah, there we go. Yes. The chains. Uh, legends. Two black. And I think every time the creature becomes tapped, it gets minus O minus two. And it's a counter, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Really cool to have these. Um, when you're following the channel, you know I love and love and love to brew uh, with foreign cards. I call them a holiday decks. And uh, so this is definitely going to go in one of my holiday decks. And here we go. Ah, I know this one. Giant Strength. Two red to give plus two plus two. An enchant creature. Also from Legends. And it's a... Okay, let me try to pronounce these, right? Uh, it's a... Uh, reason Staka. And I guess the Reason is Giant. Oh, sweet Giant Tortoise. Reason, again the Giant. Reason Schildkrota. So this is a 1-1, one, one, and as long as it's untapped, it's actually a 1-4, it's from Arabian Nights. This one's actually pretty useful. You do see this in some uh, some Singleton brews. Dust Waldkeila. The Shower von Wildschweinen. Oh, this reminds me of Asterix and Obelix. Uh, that's this cartoon, you probably, maybe you know it, maybe not. I'll have um, I'll have an image popping in of the uh, comic book I'm talking about. It's a 4-4. And Obelix used to love, loves wild boar, and he goes into the forest to hunt them. So this really reminds me of that comic. So 4-4. It's reliable. It's good. Oh, nice. I think this is a yeah German juggernaut. A 5-3. Oh, it's just lovely. It's funny. It's also called juggernaut in German. Muss wenn möglich in jedem Zug angreifen. Mauer können den Juggernaut nicht blockieren. Exactly, that's what I said. That's what I said. Okay, next one. I'm really loving all these foreign cards. Fantastic. Xenischer Poltergeist. Two black and one. And what you can do with this, it's a one one. You can tap it and it's kind of like an animate artifact on a stick, right? So I can bring target artifact to life. This is basically a mox killer as well. Next one up. Ooh, we got a Goblin King from 4th edition. Look at this. Summon Lord, and it's been errata to be a Summon Goblin Lord, I believe. So if you've got two Goblin Kings, they can pump each other. And what I really like about this card is the flavor text, by the way. To become King of the Goblins, one must assassinate the previous King. Thus, only the most foolish seek position of leadership. <laughs> Isn't that fantastic? So you're guaranteed to have the biggest idiot who's ruling the land. That is just fascinating. 2-2, uh, two, two, right, for 3. And all goblins gain mountain walk and get plus 1, plus 1. Let me put it over there. And we got a shatter. 
destroy target artifact. Beautiful. This is this is this will do nicely in my reprint collection, Plague Doctor. That's perfect. And an orcish veteran. Nice, nice, nice. Quentin Hoover art is just so beautiful. I tried to play orcs once at a Fallen Empires draft. I wasn't very successful, I have to be honest. Although I do like this one because it says cannot be assigned to block any white creature of power greater than one, so that's not great, right? But if you ignore that, then it's just a 2-2 that you can give first strike, which is actually pretty good when you look at Fallen Empires just as a set alone. There is not a lot of red that has first strike. And there we go, a Yoshin soldier. Let me actually put these in special piles. So this is the Fallen Empires department. The Fodalian soldier. And one of the cool things is here, it mentions that they would ride into battle on a war machine. And that kind of refers to one of the cards that you have, a wall uh, for merfolks. And you can actually tap your blue creatures to go into the the riding wall. And then the wall gets animated. It gets, um, it gets life. You can attack with it. Um, I think it's called Fodalian War Machine, actually. I'll have another, I'll have the card popping up right next to you so you can see it. It's pretty cool. It's not too good, but it's really cool. A Thalet, one green for a 1-1 one, one summon fungus, and during your upkeep you put a spore counter on the Thalet. You can remove three counters to make a 1-1 one, one Suprolling green creature. Next one up, a Dust to Dust. Wow, and a really beautiful one, by the way. Beautiful, dust to dust, removes two target artifacts from the game. Now what's really cool about this card, I used to think that if I would cast it and my opponent would get rid of one of his artifacts, for example, maybe he has an AO pile on the field and um, a jam day tome, and I would play this and I would target the AO pile and the jam day tome, my opponent would go in response, he would say, I'm gonna sack my AO pile and then there's only one artifact on the field and you need to target two artifacts, right? Because it reads, removes two target artifacts from the game. So, or I had to choose a new target and if the target wasn't there, I thought it fizzled, but that's actually not the case. The one artifact is still removed. You do need two targets when you cast it, but if your opponent does something in response and only one target is left, the party still continues. So that's making Dust to Dust a lot better. Um, than, I, than I actually thought it was. So it's really cool. It really pays to look at um, the gatherer from time to time to just check the most current rule sets because they do change quite a lot. And here we have, oh, this is so beautiful. Marsh Goblin, I love the art of this, the purple. So good, let's just try to zoom in correctly here. It's beautiful. One red and one black for a Swamp Walk creature counts as both black and a red card, a 1-1. One, one. I wish it would be, this one would be a Goblin Zombie. I know, I know maybe it's not that, doesn't make sense to make it a zombie just because it lives in the swamp, I know, but it would then work with uh, Zombie Master and I could put it in my zombie deck. Really, really cool. Marsh Goblins, beautiful condition, these cards, by the way. Scarwood Goblins. I made a deck called Scarwood Forest not too long ago. One red and green for a 2-2. This is actually the goblin card that everybody, um, you know, was waiting for. They just have a two drop in a goblin deck. Of course, the problem is you need green mana. And, and one of the things of aggro is you want to be consistent. So it's not great when you're building mono red goblins that you're kind of forced to put some green mana in there because it can kind of choke up your battle plan. You know, Goblin King being two red, maybe you're playing Bull Lightning being three red. So it's kind of hard to fit this in. But I mean, in theory, a two, two Goblin for two should be extremely powerful in old school magic. Next one. Oh, Marble Priest. <laughs> this, this card is, this card is crazy. Like this is such a weird card. Marble Priest, five to cast. Um, I actually, I don't own a copy of this one yet, uh, Plague Doctor, so thank you so much for sending this over. Again, a card in beautiful condition. It's a 3-3, three, three, and let's just read what it does show. It's got a whole book on here, so it's gonna take a while. 
All walls able to block marble priest must do so. Uh, walls able to block more than one creature can still do. If blocking wall is compelled to block more creatures than it is legally able to, defender chooses which of these attacking creatures to block, but must block as many creatures as it legally can. Damage dealt to marble priest from walls during combat is reduced to zero. Okay, so basically... What the marble priest does, it's so funny. Like he's the priest of the marble, right? And walls are made out of, I guess, marble, which is not true when you look at the old school walls. Most walls are, I mean, you've got wall of stone, there could be some marble in there, but most walls, you know, like you've got wall of putrefied flesh. I don't think it really cares that there is a marble priest that it's blocking, but okay. <laughs> oh, this, I love the art as well on this card. Let me just zoom in properly here. Absolutely stunning. I think, is it, I think it's Melissa Benson. When you see that, um, you see this one, that's the sign of Melissa Benson. Yes, it is her. So yeah, if you ever encounter a wall deck, Marble Priest is, I guess, your man, the man to go to. Absolutely hilarious card. Uh, thank you for, for sending it over. I believe it's also on the reserve list, by the way, although I'm not sure, I'm not really good with those lists. But I do think so. I've never seen it reprinted anyway. Let me put it that way. Uh, oh, nice craw giant. I actually owned two craw giants. So I guess now I'm the proud owner of uh, three craw giants. Four green and three to cast, right? So that's kind of huge. It's a legend. Summon giant. Trample a rampage of two. And it's a six four. Now, maybe you're wondering what does rampage do? Rampage was this uh, new mechanic that was introduced in legends. And it means that if your opponent wants to block the Craw Giant with uh, two creatures, for example, then it gains plus two, plus two, because it's got Rampage two. If it would have had Rampage one, it would get plus one, plus one. So for each creature blocking the Craw Giant after the first one, it gets the Rampage bonus. So if you would block the um, this creature with three creatures, it would get plus two plus two from the second one and plus two plus two from the third one. So it would get a bonus of plus four plus four, making it into a 10-8 trampler. So one of the things that um, you can do with this is play this card with lure, put a lure on it, forcing your opponent to blocking it with all his creatures. And because of the rampage, it can deal tons and tons of damage. It's quite a cool card. And uh, also beautiful art, of course, by Christopher Rush. I just keep saying that that the art is beautiful, but it just goes for so many cards. Um, here we go. Oh, Lady Orca. What an epic card. Is this Drew Tucker? No, it kind of looks like Drew Tucker art, you know, because of the kind of impressionistic background. But it's actually not. It's um, by Sandra. Let's have a look. Sandra Everingham. It's a 7-4. For seven mana. Actually, I recently got Boris Devil Boom, and this goes in the same color uh, group. So I can play Lady Orca and Boris Devil Boom together. It's actually kind of funny. I guess they, I guess they would date. Why not? Beautiful, beautiful card. I guess we kind of enter the the older stuff. Here we go. Wow! Look at the condition of this Dwarven Warriors. One red and two for the Dwarven Warriors, a 1-1 one, one that you can tap to make a creature of power greater than two unblockable. Very, very cool. Wow, this is like near, it's like it's fresh out of a booster pack. Amazing. Let's put that somewhere safe. Okay, and then the next one, Anime Dead. Yeah, this is such a, such a good card. Such a good card. One black and one. Enchant dead creature. Any creature in any graveyard comes into play on your side with minus one to its original power. At the end of the game, or if this enchantment is discarded without removing target creature from play, target creature is returned to owner's graveyard. Target creature may be killed as normal. So it's quite interesting. Like this card, obviously, um, you know, why it's better than Resurrection is it's less casting cost. And most importantly, you can take a creature out of any graveyard. Why it's less than Reconstruction, uh, sorry, than Resurrection in certain situations is that Resurrection is a sorcery, right? So it brings back the creature and then Resurrection goes into your bin. 
The thing with animate dead is that if your opponent has like a disenchant, gets rid of animate dead, you also lose the creature. But apart from that, animate dead, of course, is superior to uh, resurrection. Although I also love resurrection and I love the art of resurrection. And it's really this, I love playing Wrath of God in resurrection. Anyway, uh, animate dead also a very, very strong, strong card. Enjoy playing it. And the next one is, ooh, a regrowth. These cards are just in absolutely stunning condition. Regrowth, of course, is a staple in old school magic. One green and one, it's restricted, right? Bring any card from your graveyard to your hand. Of course, it's restricted for a reason because that's a very, very powerful ability. Then the next one up, a volcanic eruption, three blue and X. I saw somebody playing this with Magical Hack. Destroys X mountains of your choice and does one damage to each player and each creature in play for each mountain destroyed. Art by Douglas Schuler. So if you've got a Magical Hack, right, you can change mountain into whatever you want and you can start destroying all types of lands. Maybe I should play this in Timmy's Spellbook sideboard. It would be kind of, it's, it's a card nobody expects and that's why I kind of, that's why I like it, I guess. And next one up. Oh, very cool. Priest of Yakmoth. One black and one for a summoned clerk. One, two. It's funny that these creatures, I want to always say one, one, but then they're one, two. It's so funny. Tap to add an amount of black mana equal to target artifacts casting cost to your mana pool. This effect is played as an interrupt. Target artifact which must belong to you is discarded. This artifact cannot be one that is already on its way to the graveyard. An artifact creatures killed this way may not be regenerated. So although it's true that, you know, when they're already on their way to the graveyard, you can't like sacrifice it because it's already dead. What you can do is play this in response to a disenchant. Somebody disenchanting your, I don't know, icy, you tap it and you sack your icy for four swamp. And then, yeah, then it's of course up to you to find uh, a way to use those four swamps, of course, which is difficult, especially when it's your opponent's turn or anyway, when it's not your main phase. If it's your main phase, for example, you can use the Yakmov Priest um, or Priest of Yakmov, I should say, to create um, swamps for you to just build a huge drain life, right? That's the first thing I think about because it so specifically says that you get black mana. So for example, I sack my Colossus of Sardia, I will get nine black mana and then I can play like a huge drain life. And remember drain life, what I like about that card is it goes both ways. So it's gonna deal damage to my opponent or creature that he has that I wanna get rid of and it's gonna give me life. So yeah, Priest of Yakmov, pretty cool. Next one up here, oh, we got Detonate. I've recently played with Detonate in one of my decks uh, because when you're playing aggro red, it's just another way to deal direct damage. One red and X for a sorcery. Target any artifact. X is the casting cost of target artifact. Target artifact is destroyed and Detonate deals X damage to the artifact's controller. And the artifact destroyed in this manner may not be regenerated. So that makes it extra good. So those clay statues cannot regenerate when the detonate drops in. The cool thing is that, um, you know, when you want to use detonate to destroy like an early mox, the price of detonate is zero. And if you want to use it later in the game and you're really playing, um, you know, the pressure aggro red style deck, then you're actually happy when he plays a jam Dayton because you can just invest four into the X and it's kind of like a fireball, right? And you're destroying one of his most powerful artifacts and you're dealing four damage. It's like a win-win situation. It's, it's, it kind of feels like a two for one because you're doing two things and you're getting that out of one card. So detonate really good. The problem of course with detonate is that it's a sorcery. And when you look at shatter, um, you know, which is very business, it's just a one for one, it's an instant. So shatter you can use if you want to get rid of, for example, Mistress Factories, which are a huge thing in old school. And Detonate, you cannot use to get rid um, of a Mistress Factory. That being said, in the deck where I use Detonate, I'm playing with Blood Moon, so I don't really care about, you know, getting rid of a factory, because I've got Blood Moon anyway, which is gonna turn those factories into useless mountains, at least for my opponent useless. So that's all good. Anyway, we've got Detonate. And, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I love this card, Ashnod's Transmogrant, one to cast Antiquities, 
Target non-artifact creature gains plus one, plus one, and is now considered an artifact creature, though it retains its original color. Discard Ashnot's Transmogrant after it is used. Yeah, it's this is really handy. Um, you can use it, for example, and if you're playing with Crumble or with Scavenger Folk, it's just a way to get rid of artifact creatures. If you're playing this with, and that's how I played it, with Scavenger uh, Bandits, or no, sorry, Scarwood Bandits, not Scavenger Bandits, Scarwood Bandits, um, then um, you can actually use it to turn a creature into an artifact, then try to steal it with your bandits. And if that, when that works, it's just extremely hilarious. Another way you can use this, I, I always imagined using it with Aladdin and using it with Atok in a deck. So I'm gonna make an artifact creature, steal it with Aladdin, and then sack it to my Atok and deal damage to my opponent. I mean, that just sounds like this perfect like circle of events. Anyway, that's something you can do with it if you if you want to. It's very Timmy-ish though. Oh, beautiful desert. Really an epic card. And actually, there were a lot of deserts printed in Arabian Nights uh, because they really felt like this would be a land type that was there to stay, I, I feel. I think that was one of their intentions. Of course, it came back much, much later in the set that I don't know the name of, but it had this Egyptian theme and had a lot of desert lands. And this one reads, tap to add one colorless mana to your mana pool or do one damage to an attacking creature. Unfortunately, it reads after it's dealt its damage, uh, but still it's pretty good. And I really enjoy using this in combination with a protocol sorcerer, right? Because that means that you can now deal two damage to an attacking creature, which is a pretty good deal. Also, I've seen... Um, a player called Thais using deserts. Uh, he's, he's really he's, he's a really nice guy. He makes really fun decks. Uh, he used deserts to uh, deal a damage in his red deck to deal a damage to his Sarah Angel and then play a lightning bolt. So you know what desert basically does? It makes Sarah Angel boltable. And I really like that idea of wait a minute, you can use desert to make all those four four flyers boltable. Um, you know, and that kind of put a whole new perspective for me on this card, desert. Okay, next one. Oh, Desert Nomads. Oh, another card I don't own yet. And this is just absolutely a stunning card. Absolutely stunning card. Maybe this should be the cover photo. Desert Nomads. Oh, man, what a cool card. Uh, one red and two. And of course, yeah, let's just go back to the deserts, right? So I think the idea was that Desert would be a new land type that would kind of stick. So you had creatures with Desert Walk or creatures that couldn't be damaged by deserts. And yeah, exactly. That's Desert Nomads as well. Desert Nomads are immune to damage done by deserts. I really like this word immune. You don't see that often on, on cards, actually. It's very interesting. So it's a 2-2 two, two for 3, right? But hey, man, uh, you may think, okay, that's not great. I mean, that's Pearl Unicorn, but it's better than, than Pearl Unicorn because uh, this one has Desert Walk and it's immune to deserts. So yeah, so go fish. It's really good. I don't care. <laughs> and again, yeah, again, stunning art, but I, I just keep saying that. So, oh, look at this. Talking about art, Metamorphosis. One green to cast for a sorcery. Oh, yeah, what does this card do again? I have to read it. I can't remember. Um, sacrifice a creature of yours in play for an amount of mana to its casting cost plus one. This mana can be of any one color and can only be used to summon creatures. Ah, that's it. That is, of course, unfortunate. That last little line, it can only be used to summon creatures. I guess the idea, of course, is you're a green player, so you're playing big, fat creatures, and you're playing some mana dork enablers. And, and this way you could, or you could sack like a creature, like a spitting slug for three green, I mean, for, for three mana, right? And you get plus one. So it kind of, the plus one makes it so that this is kind of free to cast, right? So you cast this for free, then you sacrifice a creature, for example, a spitting slug, which is three. So that means you get three mana. And then you probably are in turn four when you do that, because you cast spitting slug to turn before, if you can still follow me. Then you tap your lands and you've got seven mana and you can play the Crow Giant turn four. Yes, that's what you want to do in life. So it's kind of a ramp up spell, but obviously the problem here is that you're setting yourself up for a two for one. Um, because you're losing the metamorphosis, you're losing a creature, and you're actually, and then what you get back is a bigger creature on the board, but you also then lose a card from your hand. So all in all, it, it, 
it's not great. It's, I'm sure there are some combos with Metamorphosis. Let me know if you've ever played Metamorphosis and how you've used it. I'm curious. Because if you have a good way of using it, I'm definitely going to use it. Again, maybe it's something when you use Preacher and you steal a, steal a creature from the opponent and then Metamorphosis away that creature. I, I can kind of see that happening. Ooh, we already had the the Reason Shield Krota, and now we have the Giant Tortoise, the original one. The OG, that's the word I was thinking. The OG Giant Tortoise. One blue and one, right? One one, which is a one four as long as it's as it as long as it remains untapped. Very cool. So I guess you can you can you can you can play that card on it uh, that red card for one red uh, that says it attacking creature does not cost a tap, and then you just have a one four creature all around. You've got like a giant tortoise Yoshin soldier. That's what you've built. That's actually pretty funny. Maybe 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 I should do that. Ooh, this is interesting, and I'm saying that because it's a collector's edition card. I actually only own one collector's edition card. It's a Timmy. So uh, yeah, let's flip it. See what it is. Ooh, a Drain Power, a.k.a. Elvis Presley. She's in the building. Yeah, this is one of those cards. There are discussions, right, about should we do mana burn? Should we not do mana burn? Um, and personally, I like the variety sometimes to play with, sometimes to play without. As you probably know, the format I play the most and I enjoy the most is Swedish old school magic. Um, and um, there we have no mana burn. And there was a moment where I was annoyed by that because I built a deck um, with the idea of using Drain Power. So with Drain Power does Sorcery for two blue, tap all of opponent's lands, taking all this mana and all mana in opponent's mana pool into your mana pool. And you can tap fewer than all of opponent's lands. So I just wanted to use Drain Power in the old fashioned way to kind of, you know, use the mana of my opponent to cast something. But in response, what my opponent did, my opponent just said, you know what, I'm just going to tap all my lands and not going to use that mana in response to you casting Drain Power. And then there was no uh, mana left for me to use. And I was really annoyed because it kind of feels like that should be punishable. I think that's the nice thing about mana burn. I think it's a good thing that then the wizard gets damage. Also, if you read the old books and you read what happens to a wizard, um, at a certain point, a wizard is casting like a side blast that happens the same, but also a wizard uh, uh, draws too much mana and then the, the spell fizzles. And it describes in the book that the wizard is getting nauseous and is getting a headache. And that kind of makes sense, right? Because if you're drawing the power out of the land, that power needs to go somewhere, right? And if you're not using that power anymore, it stays in your body and it kind of explodes in your body and that's going to give you pain. So from that perspective, I really understand why a lot of formats play with Mana Burn. And it makes a card like Drain Power more playable. But again, I mean, overall, I really enjoyed it personally. Personally, you know, formats in old school <laughs> are super personal because there are so many different formats. But yeah, I'm just going to say it. I, I enjoy old school Swedish the most, even though there's no Mana Burn. But for a card like Drain Power, I would love it if they would, uh, if they would play with Mana Burn. So putting this one away here. Um, and there's another one. Oh, beautiful Unlimited Terror. Look at the condition of this card. Wow. I don't, oh, I don't know if really the camera does it justice. Absolutely stunning, stunning, stunning. Of course, by Ron Spencer. This just, it's just a, look at it. Absolutely beautiful card. Destroy started creature without possibility of regenerating. This card is a little bit underplayed because you can't play it on black creatures and artifact creatures, but there are still so many targets. And I think if you would make a list while you're playing of, okay, what creatures am I seeing in this tournament, that you would be surprised how many problems would have been fixed with just a simple terror. Instant one black and one. It's great. It can get rid of those annoying Satch Trolls, get rid of Sarah Angels, get rid of Urnham, Surrender Befreeds, you name it, it can get rid of it. Um, it's just a really good card, in my opinion. Next one up, and oh, Plague Reds. Wow, it's a beta Plague Reds. One black and two. Are you, okay, of course, it's the Plague Doctor. It makes absolute sense. So Plague Doctor, are you now suggesting that I start building a beta Plague Reds deck? Is that what you're suggesting? Let me know in the comments below, because I think the answer is yes. 
it's one black and two. The X's below are the number of plague reds in play, counting both sides. Thus, if there are two plague reds in play, each has power and toughness of two, two. That is so funny. It's counting both sides. Wait a minute. So if I would be playing multiplayer and, <laughs> and multiple people would play plague reds, you would just have a rat infestation. That is really cool. That is, I've never thought about the fact that it goes both ways. Like counting both of the sides. That's so funny. You can already see, by the way, they're wording it, by the way, counting both sides, that they really didn't expect players to start playing multiplayer games. And the interesting thing is that as far as I can tell and remember from the olden days when Grandpa Timmy was still young, um, there, there were a lot of people playing multiplayer like straight away. It wasn't a new thing. Like people enjoyed playing one-on-one, -on -one, but especially I remember going to my game store and we would just sit at this huge table and would have eight, nine people play. I don't know what I was doing, by the way, because it took so long before you got a turn, but um, I guess I was trading or, I don't know, going through binders. And then when it was my turn, I would do something. But uh, I remember those huge multiplays. So I'm, I'm, it's it's funny that when they started the game, they really thought, okay, it's just a 1v1 uh, game. You know, it, you cannot play it with multiplayer. And yeah, it's, it's, it's so much fun to play multiplayer. Okay, the last card of the bunch and I just played doctor before I turned the last card around uh, I would just say wow man I'm uh, blown away by your generosity the fact that you're just sending all of this over from the states it's uh yeah it's it's great man it's absolutely great and and all these cards are going to get a good home I can tell you that so turning around and uh, there we go a sea serpent oh that's so funny I recently you probably saw that mail day video and you mailed this before you saw that because Sea Serpent is absolute love. And as you know, I bought a play set of Sea Serpents, but you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put your Sea Serpent, of course, in there and I'm going to trade away the other one. It is an absolutely stunning card. And I think uh, it was actually you playing Doctor who mentioned it in the comments of that video who said, this is one of the favorite pieces of art of um, Jeff A. Mangus, the artist of this beautiful card. And he actually still has the original sketch. So that's how much he loves the art of this card. And I absolutely understand why the art is just absolutely beautiful, brilliant, and it really speaks, it really speaks to the imagination. You know, it's beautiful. And I know that um, transcripts were found of the early Greek explorers who started, you know, to building boats and go on the sea and they actually saw a whale for the first time. And can you imagine when you see a whale for the first time? So they came back and they described the whale just like this huge kraken sea monster, just like this huge sea serpent. You know, you have to imagine, imagine that you're traveling the world and you're seeing things for the first time. And that's, of course, the downside of the Internet, of the television. It takes away those experiences, just going out there and seeing things for the first time. And I, I am so jealous of those early explorers. And I think, yeah, I think it's just part of, of the beauty that's like, for me, this Jeff Mangus art is kind of showing that tale, although in a very aggressive way. It's not like, are oh, you seeing a harmonious whale in the distance? No, it's, you're being attacked by a huge sea serpent. And I've always imagined this to be a Viking boat, by the way, I guess because of this part of the bow. So there you can see shade of a soldier. Really beautiful. So when you, just the way how the sea serpent comes out of the sea and it's the colors kind of match the rug, rugged, rugged, is that a word? Rugged sea. Here you see the tail going around the boat. Absolutely, absolutely stunning. Um, so, wow, what an amazing meal day. Also, uh, thanks, thank you, Robert, for the beautiful cards. I think this... Chewed Up Clone is the favorite of all the cards that you send me. I'm just, uh, I'm going to love, going to love playing this one in my Unsleep Revised deck. And uh, yeah, and Wild Plague Doctor, amazing, amazing what you've, what you've all sent my way. Uh, and I would also like to thank you, the viewer, of course, for watching another episode right here on Timmy Talks. And I'm looking at the clock. Wow, this mail day took 45 minutes. Amazing. Um, so thank you if you stuck through, uh, if you... 
stuck all the way through this video. Thank you uh, for that. Um, I really know that some of you really enjoy the mail day videos and I really enjoy making them and kind of sharing how I go through uh, the mails that I get and the magic cards that I get. This really, really was a special mail day. So thank you, Robert and Plague Doctor. And also thank you for watching another episode here on Timmy Talks. If you want to help the channel, um, it's very simple. You can like this video. There's my thumb. Um, you can also leave a comment. So let me know, like, where's the card at? Let me know, have you ever used Metamorphosis? And if so, how have you used it? I mean, I'd love to use it. So let me know in the comments below. And by leaving a comment, you're also helping the channel. Uh, what else you can do is you can become a subscriber. There's still a lot of people that are watching my videos, which is awesome, uh, but are not subscribed. I'm not saying that you have to subscribe, but please consider it. It really helps the channel grow and show YouTube, you know, that the channel matters. Talking about that, you can also become a patron uh, like Plague Doctor and Robert, and then you can support Timmy Talks financially. And you can do that um, uh, by clicking on the info card that's appearing right now. That will take you to our Patreon page. And uh, when you become a member, you can join our Discord and you can also uh, enjoy uh, and join the Timmy Talks events like tournaments. Uh, we've got, I think, a, a bingo's coming up. Uh, yeah, we like we do a lot of crazy stuff and you get to meet everybody else who's in the community um, and they're all they all got a pretty high Timmy level, if, uh, as you can imagine, you know. Um, anyway, uh, that's it for now. And uh, let's go to the end scroll. And let's take a look at the fantastic and amazing wonderful patrons and channel members of Timmy Talks. Ich kann das Fingertisch zum Bakasin.